Okay, thank you. All right, so it's a thank you. Thanks for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be uh, to be speaking in this lecture series put on by the American Center for Mongolian Studies uh, to be among friends and among colleagues uh, from Mongolia. So uh, my name is Eric Thrift. I am a social cultural anthropologist and recently, a pro uh, since recently, a professor uh, of social cultural anthropology at the University of Winnipeg. Um, and as we heard in the introduction, my current research project is. Uh, on Kashmir, and the title of it uh, is Untangling the Ethics of Sustainable Kashmir. Uh, so the goal of this research right now is to really look at what we mean by sustainable Kashmir and to think about the ethics of commodity chains. Uh, so in today's presentation, I'd like to share some of the ideas and some of the initial findings uh, with this project uh, or from this project. So why do ethics matter in commodity cashmere chains? Well, uh, to start out with, we all have an interest in planetary sustainability. We all share the need to make responsible or ethical choices as we go about our lives. Uh, as consumers, many of us are concerned about the ethics of our product choices, given the knowledge that some of the products available to us may be produced in exploitative or environmentally damaging ways. We know that our own economic choices have an impact on sustainability, but it isn't always clear what that impact might be. And this is particularly the case with clothing, uh, such as cashmere. Um, uh, so for consumers in Canada, as in many other parts of the world, apparel commodities are almost guaranteed to be imported from really far away places that we often know very little about. Uh, they're made by people we don't know, that we don't see, and whose work conditions and livelihoods and overall aspirations are generally a mystery to us. So the marketing messages seen by international consumers, like the ones on this slide here, uh, so the image seems to not be showing up for some reason, but in any case, you can see the message. They in invite us to consider how cashmere garments might complement our wardrobe. They tell us what kind of look we'll achieve, or they might tell us uh, how we might feel, for example, luxurious and indulgent, perhaps, or as described by this boutique in, I'm not sure what's going on with the uh, with the images here, maybe I'm just going to um, share, uh, adjust the, the, the sharing option instead of sharing screen. I'm going to try and, uh, sorry, share the, uh, the presentation directly, apologies for this. Uh -huh. uh, where were we? um powerpoint slideshow i think this is the one okay and now i think we can see the pictures all right so uh so we have this marketing message messages that invite us to consider how cashmere garments might complement our wardrobe what kind of look we'll achieve um they'll tell us how we might feel uh like this uh, uh luxurious or indulgent as we see in this uh, boutique from northampton in england its own sweet and sparkling universe of inner fun found in every woman um, we're told that cashmere is soft and durable and warm. Uh, we may rely on manufacturer claims that they sell are produced responsibly or ethically, or that they're 100% soft and sustainable. But we can't typically see the evidence to back up those assertions. And not everyone uses these terms to mean the same thing. With cashmere, the term sustainable has been used to refer to uh, the a number of different things. For example, the amount of natural resources that are used in producing a cashmere garment, whether grazing is within rangeland carrying capacity, uh, the impacts of livestock production on wildlife, whether suppliers get a fair price, and so on and so forth. Uh, so as I was saying, my current research project looks at mark these marketing claims and standards that are intended to describe so-called sustainable cashmere uh, in order to better understand how people are actually using those terms and uh, following on that what we can do to make the ethics of cashmere production a little bit more transparent so from the outset we have three immediate and related findings that i'll be presenting today First is that the voices of cashmere suppliers, so Mongolian herders uh, for the most part, are effectively absent from the messaging that reaches uh, consumers overseas. Second, measures of cashmere sustainability are typically technical ones, but these measures are being framed by broader stories uh, or narratives that interpret the past and set out prognoses for the future. Uh, spoiler alert, these are stories in which Mongolian herders are not the protagonists. Instead, Kashmir pro uh, projects and companies depict themselves in these narratives as, as coming to the rescue. And I'll discuss 
uh, in, a, in a few moments about why that is problematic. And third, there is no discussion of cultural value in efforts to describe sustainability in the Kashmir sector. So at the end of this presentation, I'll get to cultural indicators or the cultural aspects uh, or how we should include culture in our ways of assessing and presenting the value of sustainable Kashmir. Uh, but I'll get there somewhere somewhat indirectly because I'd like to com uh, communicate something about the ethics of representation in the Kashmir trade. Uh, that's something that underlies all three of the points that I've just mentioned, and that I think is central to the idea of Kashmir as cultural commodity. Uh, in the first component of our research project, we went through over 700 English language Kashmir marketing resources. These included online stories, uh, or online stores, I should say, YouTube videos, post podcasts, blogs, and social media posts. Uh, and these are all resources in which the term sustainable Kashmir or some variation of it was being explicitly used. In many instances, we didn't find any clear explanation at all for why the product was being described as sustainable. Uh, this was often the case on social media, particularly with ethical fashion influencers and with retailers who simply took the word of manufacturers that the products they were promoting were sustainably made. Some retailers had sustainability statements that were vague or difficult to assess, such as the claims we see on this slide here, that uh, garments were sustainable because they were well-made and meant to last. Uh, but among those actors who made more specific claims, we found that this idea of sustainable Kashmir was being indexed to a wide range of markers. And these included the terms I put on the screen, eco-friendly, ethical, wildlife friendly, humane, and responsibly produced. For example, some labels, including Patagonia, Stella McCartney, and Frame, have applied the term sustainable cashmere to recycled or re-engineered garments. Uh, this indicates a refusal to use virgin fibers altogether. Then we have kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum, brands like uh, luxury brands like Loro Piana, whose claims to sustainability include that the actual material uh, output of their work is minuscule, uh, since the company in this case presents an extremely limited offering to very, very high-end consumers, extremely high-priced cashmere garments. Uh, by contrast, we have uh, organizations like the Sustainable Fiber Alliance, which is based in the UK, that has brought together Mongolian rangeland scientists and processors to work with herders in promoting a mainstream approach to sustainable development, which includes environmental, economic, and social dimensions, or the three pillars, as we call them, of sustainable development. As part of this initiative, uh, the Rangeland Stewardship Code of Practice describes how, and I'm quoting, productive grasslands and their biodiversity must be managed with environmental and social considerations. And there are similar certification schemes applied elsewhere that have put uh, different amounts of weight on different factors, uh, such as livestock health. Uh, so we hear, see here on the screen uh, a screenshot from the Sustainable Kashmir Certification uh, created by AVSF, the veterinary aid uh, organization, uh, which is being implemented in the uh, Bayon uh, Sustainable Kashmir Project. Uh, there's also the Aid by Trade Foundation's Good Kashmir Standard, which is introduced and being applied in Inner Mongolia. So basically, I've given a sense that, you know, there are all, all, all these competing claims about sustainability, what it means, what it means to buy ethical uh, cashmere. And it would be unsurprising if a consumer, and it is unsurprising, consumers do have trouble uh, making sense of what those complete competing claims are. But across these marketing materials, we see some commonalities in way, the ways in which those claims are actually being made or presented. Uh, so one of the approaches we take in anthropology, which is my discipline, is to look at how we understand complex phenomena by creating stories or narrative frames around them. Um, so a dominant narrative right now is that consumer demand for low-priced cashmere has stimulated overproduction, leading to overgrazing and rangeland degradation. As the cashmere producer Frame put it, uh, Mongolian grasslands are being destroyed due to high demand of cashmere. Uh, part of this story is actually conveyed not by marketers, but through mainstream media, uh, or what consumers see is often con conveyed through mainstream media, uh, often reporting on the work of researchers or development practitioners who are associated with sustainable cashmere initiatives and labels. Uh, 
uh, North American consumers have been confronted in the past uh, five or six years at least with news reports asserting that Kashmir is ruining or decimating Mongolia's grasslands. Uh, and by extension, that global consumers have an ethical obligation to demand and to pay a premium for sustainably produced Kashmir. Uh, with this image, which accompanied an online version of an M NPR story in the United States, uh, the caption reads, I'm quoting, in the place where Bish has pish, pitched her gear or tent, the effects of overgrazing are obvious. Sand dunes appear where grass used to grow. Okay, so uh, dire messages of overgrazing and desertification. Uh, we've seen similar alarmist headlines in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, BBC, NPR, as seen here, Science, Forbes, and other sources. Uh, in this article from the Wall Street Journal, uh, published a few years ago, herders are presented as destructive, reckless, uncontrolled. Uh, the graph on the right highlights a sharply rising number of goats in Mongolia. And the underlying message from this Wall Street Journal article is that this kind of vertical trajectory, this ever increasing number of goats that's destroying pasture uh, in Mongolia is not going to end on its own. The only way that it's going to stop is if somebody intervenes and that could be H&M, Gucci, fashion consumers, someone needs to step in and, and stop this from happening. So, I mean, this brings to this, this kind of next point of the, the next stage of the analysis, and, and it's kind of a flippant summary maybe that, that I gave here, but it, it gets at a major point of concern, which is that the stories that consumers are reading are being told within this framework of rescue or of salvation. That is to say, Mongolian rangelands and herders need to be saved by ethical brands or by consumers from the West. Uh, so you may already be familiar with critiques of the so-called white savior trope. Uh, some scholars more recently have associated this with the so-called uh, white savior industrial complex. Uh, this is a critical term that's used in anthropology and in other related social sciences and, and humanities disciplines primarily, um, where we're problematizing forms of aid that seem to be noble and charitable, or at least to the people who are you know, providing the aid, but in fact perpetuate difference by refusing to acknowledge the agency of beneficiaries or so-called beneficiaries who are Black, Indigenous, people of color, or people from the global south. And of course, we can include Mongolia within, within that uh, category as well. So this term describes development initiatives in which the white savior he heroically intervenes, Bill Gates giving away billions to save people from malaria, for example, or the Christian uh, missionary tourists building schools and wells in the rural developing world. Uh, but as scholar Brittany Aronson has argued, it also represents an ingrained ethics, right? So coming back to this point about the ethics of uh, commodity chains, this is a Christian ethics with Christian roots uh, that's uh, dominant across Western society. So in my own review of the English language sustainable Kashmir marketing resources, the 700 resources where we did the, uh, you know, the, the, the literature analysis and frame analysis, um, I refer to this dominant narrative around sustainability as an offshoot of the white savior complex, uh, suggesting that it follows what I'm calling the good Samaritan frame, basically. So all the, the accounts that I'll describe are not always told in narrative sequence, but they do conform to the same general structure. So it's a story where the protagonist is an outsider brand or a development organization that looks upon an unsustainable scene in Mongolia. They see a crisis due to maladaptation to changing conditions, changing market conditions or changing ecological conditions. They offer a prognosis and then sensing a duty to act, they intervene. So, and at the end of the story, the protagonist issues an appeal to others to help them out or to do the same. So this is like the Good Samaritan in the parable. I said, it's a, you know, it's a Christian ethics. Uh, so this is a parable told by Jesus in the New Testament, uh, uh, the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament of the Bible. Uh, the Good Samaritan in the biblical story um, is moved by compassion to stop and clean the wounds of an unknown man who has been injured by robbers. And the Samaritan, of course, is, is an, uh, a member of a different, um, we could say a different ethnic group who 
traditionally would have been considered enemies. Uh, you see the pious, uh, you know, priest or, or rabbi who goes by and refuses to help. Uh, the Samaritan stops and, and, and helps out and proves that he is the true neighbor and thus demonstrates virtue in, in the eyes of God, according to this religious parable. Um, so similarly, in this, in this case here, we see the protagonist is an unlikely hero, but one who recognizes that they have an ethical obligation rather than the choice to help someone in need. Uh, so here's, I'll give three brief retellings of how this story might work with the same structure, different content, okay, but all the same ethics of the Good Samaritan, that is to say somebody who's as a passerby, somebody who's not invested in a situation, trying to help out um, for ethical reasons because they see somebody who is in need of assistance. So this first retelling is the one is basically the story told by, told by Kiering, a uh, luxury fashion group based in France, their owner of several brands, Gucci, Yves Saint Laurent, formerly uh, Stella McCartney as well. So once upon a time, cashmere was a luxury good. Production was very limited and demand was low. But then some apparel companies began selling inexpensive cashmere garments, which rapidly became ubiquitous. Mongolian herders responded to the increased consumer demand by breeding more and more goats, which started depleting natural resources. It takes four goats to make enough cashmere for just one sweater. And those goats require significant vegetation and water inputs in a relatively arid region of the world not to mention the damage they cause to soil and vegetation roots with their hooves through trampling. Continued, continued production of cashmere to satisfy market demand would quickly result in desertification. So carrying the luxury fashion company felt that it had an obligation to help prevent the environmental catastrophe brought about by fast fashion. The company developed an open source environmental accounting method, which it called uh, environmental profit and loss, or EP&L, to measure and adjust the environmental impacts of its own supply chain. Caring's then affiliate Stella McCartney determined that its use, its own use of cashmere accounted for 28% of their total EP&L impact. So all of the you know, environmental impact of all their uh, of all their clothing production, 28% despite the fact that cashmere was only 0.1% of their uh, overall material usage. So to reduce this impact, Kering began to use only recycled or what they call re-engineered cashmere in its, in its supply chain, withdrawing entirely from the Mongolian economy and appealed to others in the industry to do the same. But at the same time, Kering partnered with the Wildlife Conservation Society, or uh, WCS, Stanford University, the mining conglomerate Rio Tinto, and other organizations, as we see on the screen here, to implement the sustainable Kashmir project in Mongolia, uh, now known as the South Gobi Kashmir product, uh, project, uh, designed largely to insist, enlist herders in conservation efforts. As a result of this in intervention, Mongolia's grasslands will have the chance to recover and maybe um, they will be able to return to Kashmir production uh, in Mongolia. So that's the first version. Uh, here's a second version of this, well, the same, not the same story, but using the same kind of good Samaritan frame. And I'll, I'll get to an analysis of these at the end. This is told by Nadam, which may, you may know about, a direct to consumer sustainable Kashmir startup company. Uh, or they were a startup, now they're pretty big, launched through a Kickstarter campaign in 2014 that has procured raw, raw cashmere from Bayonger and from other places. Uh, once upon a time, according to this version of the story, Mongolian herders were organized in state-managed collectives. Okay, uh, So one day, with Mongolia's sudden transition to a market economy, supply chains broke down and fell into the hands of ruthless middlemen, the change. Herders became captive to a market in which prices were kept artificially low. Herders found themselves effectively indentured to the middlemen, which prevented them from accumulating capital or investing in livestock health, things that they recognized as important but couldn't afford. Given these artificial constraints on growth and innovation in the pastoral economy, young generations saw new, no future for themselves as herders. Matt Scanlon, a disillusioned young Wall Street banker who was backpacking through Mongolia, looking for new purpose in his life, saw the potential to bring dignity to Mongolian herders by applying his marketing skills to, quote unquote, disrupt the Kashmir commodity or uh, commodity chain. So Scanlon founded Nadam Kashmir through a Kickstarter campaign as a company that would promote sustainable Kashmir. 
Uh, the company targeted millennial consumers through innovative marketing campaigns like we see on the screen and a direct to consumer or DTC sales model, model helped by social media influencers. Nadam bought up raw cashmere, as they say, at a premium directly from herders, circumventing the middlemen. Meanwhile, they partnered with a local NGO and development organizations to support livestock insurance, veterinary care, and other interventions that were already in place in the communities where they so sourced their cashmere. As a result of this business, Mongolian cashmere suppliers will be able to live in dignity. Younger herders will recognize that cashmere production can be a forward thinking type of business and consumers can trust that their sustainable cashmere garments have been produced fairly. Okay, and finally, the third telling of the story, again, somewhat different. This is Laura Piana. I mentioned them earlier, the Italian luxury menswear producers who specialize actually in cashmere and wool garments, part of the same family as Louis Vuitton, very, very high end. Uh, here's a retelling of their version of the, the, the story of sustainability. Once upon a time, Mongolian pastoralists lived as isolated nomadic communities in the mountains and steppes of Inner Asia. They continued to live this way for many generations until at one point the world started to become smaller and the herders found themselves thrust into a global economy. While Mongolian herders continued to sell raw cashmere as they had always done, the global economy increasingly valued quantity over quality as there was no value placed on culturally appropriate, traditional, sustainable production, herders were at risk of losing their culture and unique relationship with the land. The luxury fashion house Laura Piana saw the need to take action, recognizing that the cashmere they produced was already known as a premium product. They saw the opportunity to connect ecological and cultural sustainability as a marker of luxury value. So they initiated an approach which they called the Loro Piana method, which enabled herders to earn a higher prices for premium quality cashmere produced from smaller and more intensively managed herds. The designer joined forces with scientists, uh, this is in Inner Mongolia, so uh, Inner Mongolian and Chinese scientists and herders uh, to implement its program. Uh, Laura Piana also called upon the naturalist filmmaker Luc Jacquet, who was producer of the March of the Penguins, to create a cinematic version of sustainable luxury cashmere, uh, which presents it really as a kind of luck natural commodity, one that originates with herders and goats who are effectively part of nature. And the, the, the photographs that I've chosen here are the still images or promotional stills from that film. As a result of this intervention, Mongolian nomadic pastoralists will be able to carry on their harmonious way of life securely as overseas luxury consumers implicitly celebrate this indigenous lifestyle through their taste in sustainability. So there are, of course, more stories than I, I could report than these three, but I'd like to point to, to comment on some of the things that they have in common. So I mentioned at the beginning that they all adopt what I've been calling a Good Samaritan frame to address a perceived sustainability crisis. In each case, the fundamental problem is experienced within Mongolia, but it can only be solved really with the intervention of the protagonist. It's like the, you know, the the, the man who's been beaten by robbers who can't help himself. He'd be, he, you know, he would die if left uh, left there uh, all alone. So the problem can only be solved with the help of an outsider, an outside sympathetic protagonist, the empathetic uh, ethical outsider. Uh, because herders themselves are incapable of escaping the bind in which they find themselves. For Loro Piana, herders are, you know, anthropologically, we might call them, you know, the, this idea of the noble savage, victim to a global commodity chain that doesn't value their traditional indigenous way of life. Yet the luxury retailer has the power to create this kind of value within the value chain. For caring, uh, herders are manipulated in a sense by global consumer demand, right? Uh, the solution, right, too much demand, so overproduction. So the solution for them is to cut the demand for virgin cashmere downstream. Uh, and as a multi-billion dollar luxury fashion group, they have the power to do this by, you know, cutting cashmere entirely out of their own, uh, their own value chain. For Nadam, Herders are being exploited by middlemen, which threatens the sustainability of cashmere production-based livelihoods overall. So their solution is to bring creative disruption from without, 
uh, unfettered by commitments to existing practices, existing businesses practices or business relationships. Um, and as an outside venture capitalist transporting a literal truckload of cash into the Mongolian uh, countryside, Nadam's co-founder has the unique power to do this. So in each case, the attributive claims about the processes leading to catastrophe are suggested and framed by the identities of those who come to help and what they're actually positioned to offer. Uh, symbolic value in the luxury market, control of the value chain, or basically untied cash. So as each of these interventions takes shape, the underlying story has become really a justifying narrative that uh, that drives further action, uh, presented to donors in funding proposals, narrated in project reports, told in workshops and meetings, shared on websites, podcasts, and social media. So each of these stories is sometimes, and I'm thinking more in the development space right now, illustrated by technical data, tables, graphs, maps, uh, showing increased numbers of goats, or increased land degradation. But these figures are only really given meaning through the narrative framing that expresses their causes and the prognostic effects. So these stories all present the storyteller as protagonist, as facing an ethical call to action, uh, which will become a defining moment in their own self-identity as a sustainable actor within the commodity chain. So in this sense, each story has a fundamentally moral purpose, okay, insofar as it models what an ethical Good Samaritan should do, help the weak, a little or no cost to the actor to avoid a sustainability crisis. So this is a situationally motivated form of ethics in the, sen in the sense that the central claim, which is that it's unethical to remain a passive witness to harm, right? Uh, this is more contextually specific than the broader claims like the world needs to be more sustainable or no one should be left behind, the central claim of the sustainable development goals, right? Uh, in those broader ethical claims, there's no clear agent. So in the, in the situational ethics though, there is, uh, there is an ethical claim or an assertion about uh, needing to act that is tied to the identity of the actor basically. Each story depicts two alternative futures, a future of almost certain disaster and a more vague but positive future that avoids catastrophe. Uh, Laura Piana, which began as a family textile business two centuries ago, describes a future that is more or less frozen in time, really, uh, despite the intrusion of the modern global economy. So insulating uh, inner Mongolian herders essentially from globalization. It's not hard to read into this story a concern by the luxury retailer for its own future in a rapidly changing economy. Similarly, Nadam describes a future in which herders' lives are shaped by sustainable business relationships, bypassing corrupt networks of middlemen and local officials. It's also hard not to read into this story a reflection of the millennial entrepreneur's faith in disruptive innovation as a solution to unsustainability and, and other problems in, in the world. Uh, in one interview, uh, Nadam co-founder Scanlon remarks, you know, what is sustainability? He says, quote, sustainability equals innovation and a product market fit, end quote. So innovation is the solution to basically anything, right? Including sustainability. So these future telling stories may diverge strikingly from the local stories told by Mongolians themselves, right? And and, and it's from this perspective that I'm really trying to advance the argument um, that, you know, we need to think about Kashmir as uh, embedded within local culture. What does it mean to think of local culture and identities? Um, and it leads me to the second part of our research in which we're trying to capture alternative local stories and design new ways of presenting them through Kashmir commodity chains. So I mentioned at the beginning, the voices and concerns of Kashmir suppliers, i.e. Mongolian herders, but also traders and processors. Uh, they're generally absent from the global discourse and specifically within the marketing discourse uh, on Kashmir sustainability. So anytime we read about uh, sustainable Kashmir, we don't really hear anything from the perspective of herders, for example. We hear a lot about herders, but nothing you know, in their voice. Uh, but, and I mentioned it's not just herders. The government of Mongolia itself has implemented a, a, a national program on Kashmir to increase domestic processing as an economic development priority. Um, I mean, this has 
the precise opposite of what organizations like Stella McCartney and Curing have, have seen as the ethical choice being you know, to halt production altogether. So we have this divergence of ideas about what it means to be uh, sustainable. Uh, and generally what we are seeing sort of outside of Mongolia uh, are the versions of those stories that are told by actors who are like not government of Mongolia, they're not herders, they are not uh, Mongolian and thinking of the priorities and needs uh, uh, associated with local culture. So English language publications about the South Gobi uh, Kashmir project, the one uh, with the Ayur Tadra, for example, have you know, universally championed the value of this initiative for rangelands and wildlife, right? So wildlife are, are, are benefiting greatly from the project, but they have relatively little to say about herders themselves. So the example on this screen is a commissioned article in the Australian Financial Review from 2018, so uh, towards the beginning of the project, which describes their international ac experts as literally coming to the rescue. For example, uh, but they offer no acknowledgement to Herder's own discourse on the ecological destruction and displacements caused by the mine itself, which is a major funder and partner in the project, contrary to local anti-mining activist uh, movements at the very same site. Uh, similarly, the 2019 article I mentioned earlier that was published in the Wall Street Journal features perspectives on Kashmir sustainability from Gucci, from H&M, from PETA, um, you know, the Humane Animal Treatment Society, a foreign-owned exporter, the Sustainable Kashmir Project, and the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. But none of the sources, none of the people interviewed for this story are Mongolian herders. Instead, herders are consistently portrayed as the victims of a skewed market, of poor governance institutions, of a failed economic system, or of a lack of technical knowledge. Uh, herders lack agency in these accounts, yet they're also viewed as the main cause of the problem. Uh, for example, Stella McCartney's own website attributes the degradation and desertification of 70% of Mongolia's rangelands to overgrazing by herders in response to a market for inexpensive Kashmir. So we're finding that Mongolian herders, by contrast, describe sustainability with re reference to several distinct uh, political frames. And it's sort of no accident. It's deliberate that I included the, the, the screenshot related to political discourse, you know, and mentioned the national program on Kashmir and efforts to increase the Kashmir or build the Kashmir sector uh, as an export sector uh, as part of uh, the, the national political discourse, right? These are political, uh, political questions, right? Um, and when we link the, the political frames to the culture, we can begin to see issues come to the surface, such as, you know, from the herder perspective, mobility rights and uh, overall cultural survival. So sustainability from the herder standpoint specifically, I'm not speaking about all actors in Mongolia right now, from the herder standpoint specifically, uh, can be said to encompass social and political factors that contribute to the survival of nomadic pastoralism as an overall system, right? Not just the survival of wildlife, not just um, you know, incomes, but whether they can continue being herders is really the priority uh, that we're hearing in interviews uh, done with past uh, pastoralists, with herders who are working in the Kashmir supply chain. So some sustainability indicators from this standpoint might include the ones that I, I put on the slide. This is not an exhaustive or exclusive list. Uh, things like rights to mobility and access to water and grazing areas. Recognition of customary rights and practices, uh, autonomy in natural resource management, protections against large scale resource users, uh, for example, mining companies, uh, and livelihood diversity. Okay, so these are these factors all involve political claims that can be just justified by or operate in service of ideas of cultural value. So from this observation, we're beginning to think about how to bring culture into commodity chain governance and into the idea of sustainability itself. Uh, one of the goals here is to find ways to incorporate cultural measures into sustainability standards, or at least ways of defining and thinking about sustainability. And more broadly, this connects with the goal of linking cultural concerns with SDG 12, responsible uh, consumption and production. As you may know, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, incorporate three pillars of sustainable development, as we see on the screen, the social, the environmental, and economic. And this is not unique to the SDGs. This is sort of the, 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 the mainstream way of framing uh, the concept of sustainable development. And we see this across like the literature, the scholarship on uh, sustainable development today. But 
Uh, the SDGs and sustainability have been critiqued, criticized by uh, some scholars for leaving out culture as a fourth major pillar. For example, uh, the targets for SDG 2 call for the world to double the agricultural productivity and incomes of small scale food producers, including pastoralists and indigenous peoples. But these targets and indicators say nothing about ensuring the availability of culturally appropriate foods and food pr uh, production practices, uh, which in fact risk being displaced by more specialized intensive forms of production as anticipated by this, uh, this target of doubling productivity. Similarly, with the Kashmir commodity chain, how can we be sure that wildlife friendly or biodiversity friendly production methods are also culturally appropriate? So this is the, the big question basically that we're asking here. Not that we're against you know, wildlife protections or any of the goals that have been presented by sustainable Kashmir projects or by any of the, uh, any of the labels who are trying to create a sustainable Kashmir commodity chain, but how can we add you know, cultural factors and cultural considerations on top of that? So that you know brings us back to this argument I started about out with about ethical consumerism. Many of us as consumers want to buy sustainable clo clothing, but we're not really sure what to believe or what even to ask for. How can we make sense of these divergent and potentially problematic claims about sustainable cashmere? Well, one uh, central area of response to this problem, and one that we're you know trying to think about, but also problematize, right? So to you know, uh, to support but also problematize is what we call commodity chain governance. So commodity chain governance is conventionally viewed as having lead firms, right, in a value chain. Uh, those would be the international buyers uh, who are, you know, who basically act responsibly and where uh, applicable comply with external standards such as food safety, offshore labor regulations, uh, ISO certification, fair trade, uh, organic certifications, and these may these various uh, laws and, uh, and regulations and standards may be enforced through inspections and audits. So a major challenge with global commodity chain governance, right? So this is cross-boundary governance here, right? So outside of the purview of an individual government. So who governs, right? Who establishes, you know, the the equivalent of you know national laws and regulations when you have this unregulated, you know, so to speak, commodity chain that crosses national boundaries. So the, the argument with, you know, with this model is you need the lead firms to take on that responsibility and to announce themselves as being ethical, uh, ethical actors. So a major challenge with this involves what Bostrom and colleagues have called the geographical gap between supplier and consumer. So distance from the environmental and social impacts of production hinders public debate and opinion formation on actual matters of importance. Uh, a more fundamental critique, however, is that global standards can actually stifle essential discussion of definitional problems. And that, I think that's a related critique. What does it actually mean to be ethical or sustainable in each setting and at each scale? How do the ethical concerns of the herder potentially resonate with, but also diverge from those of the overseas consumer? Uh, there are also various related concerns that have been really raised in anthropological work that has problematized ethical trade initiatives around the world. Uh, some research, for example, has demonstrated that fair trade producer groups may not share their northern partners' understanding of labor ethics and so-called empowerment. Uh, they may be far less democratic than the, the northern partners believe or assume them to be. Uh, their participation in fair trade initiatives may serve to advance political goals, such as indigenous rights or autonomy, rather than the expected economic ones like poverty re reduction and fair pricing. Okay. There's also the, this paradox of uh, fair trade's pursuit of market-based solutions to problems that originate in markets themselves. Uh, so from this perspective, critical theorists have been arguing that rather than creating openings for discussion of what fair and sustainable production and livelihood should entail, ethical trade initiatives typically rely on technical indicators that serve to privilege expert knowledge. This evokes uh, familiar concerns about the depoliticization or what Tanya Lee has called the rendering technical of development work more, uh, more gener generally. So we can identify some of these concerns in relation to two existing market-based responses to sustainable cashmere, environmental accounting and sustainability certification schemes. 
Uh, Kering's environmental accounting methods, which I mentioned earlier, calculate basically how much water, vegetation, fuel, and other resources are consumed throughout the process of making a cashmere garment from, folk, uh, from goats all the way up to factory production and then retail. If the balance of resource use is below a certain, a certain threshold, uh, the product may be considered sustainable. Uh, this type of sustainability assessment can be problematic for Mongolian herders because it implies that traditional herding culture itself has become potentially unsustainable in the modern world, and that herders must shift to new herding technologies in order to reduce their environmental impacts to sustainable levels. So taking, if we take cultural sustainability into account, we would suggest that instead of relying on measurable indicators of natural resource use, it would be more helpful to assess whether current market and political conditions ensure herders' ability to practice nomadic animal husbandry using sustainable customary knowledge and techniques. In other words, we could say that traditional nomadic pastoralism itself might be considered inherently sustainable in ecological and economic terms, but that the sustainability of this production system is threatened by outside factors that are beyond the immediate control of herders themselves. Uh, so in interviews, some herders have told us that their access to grazing areas and water sources is being threatened by mining activity, for instance. Uh, other herders have described a limited capacity to move due to the high density of herders in desirable grazing areas, near swim centers, close to water points, uh, potentially including families on Otra from other areas. So these are fundamentally governance issues. They're not technical issues to be resolved through a shift to new or more intensive or more you know, uh, technically improved forms of production necessarily. Uh, a second technical response to commodity chain governance challenge challenges is to create a standard or certification scheme where we have a set of known indicators with clearly defined assessment criteria. And this is the, the approach taken by an independent market-based labeling and certification initiative, such as Fair Trade, uh, which place demands on suppliers and producers to ensure that their uh, products meet ethical requirements. <clears throat> So in Mongolia, we've all we have several standards that relate to sustainability, as I've already mentioned. So there is MNS uh, 6926 from last year, sustainable textile production. It's mainly about wool and cashmere. Uh, the AVSF sustainable cashmere certification, which includes guidelines and a workbook listing 25 requirements for herders uh, to ensure that their herding practices are ecologically and socially sustainable. And the Sustainable Fiber Alliance certification, which requires that producers have collective rangeland management plans in place, in addition to meeting specific criteria for livestock health management. These standards and certifications aim to bring value to Mongolian herders and producers, assuming that international consumers are willing to pay more for certified, responsibly produced goods. But these certification measures, again, generally reflect outside rather than local definitions of sustainability. None of the, of the schemes I've just listed include specific indicators of cultural sustainability. Uh, in some cases, sustainability standards can also be used to promote the view that uh, Mongolian traditional herding knowledge and practices are outdated and need to be changed through technical interventions. Uh, that's not always the case, though. Uh, documents such as the Good Kashmir Standard used in Inner Mongolia, the AVSF, uh, AVFS um, Sustainable Kashmir Standard, the Codes of Practice of the SFA, set out an extensive series of criteria related to livestock production technology, which may involve a combination of herder, herder self-assessment and external audits. From a livestock management perspective, these standards employ precise technical indicators that may or may not correlate to the traditional practices associated with, with what we might call in quotation marks, nomadic culture. For instance, in the SFA Animal Husbandry and Cashmere Fiber Harvesting Code of Practice, uh, uh, an extract of which we see on the screen, we see a codification of some practices that are already part of traditional husbandry messages, uh, methods rather. Uh, water troughs must be kept clean. Uh, fouled or stale feel, feed must be removed. Livestock enclosures must be made of natural materials, such as wood. Uh, goats should be combed rather than shorn. Uh, herders must have methods for managing orphan kids. Uh, goats should be grazed on vegetation that provides a full diet. In terms of nomadic movement specifically, the standard requires that camps be selected in consideration of, quote, the types of plants, exposure to sunlight, speed of wind, and amount of snowfall. Now, in this instance, the standard positively acknowledges Mongolian nomadic herding practices as a legitimate, 
internationally recognized, sustainable, and animal-friendly form of livestock production. At the same time, the SFA codes of practice and the AVSF uh, sustainable cashmere standard both require some institutional transformation um, to mobility practices by insisting on rangeland use coordinated through pasture user groups or similar entities as regulated through texts such as resource and wildlife assessments, rangeland management plans, and monitoring and evaluation plans. Herders are thus expected to shift away from an informally regulated or possibly unregulated form of rangeland selection toward a form that is formally coordinated among households within a clearly defined management area and made legible to outsiders through written documents. These new regulatory practices imply a preference for stability and control over flexibility and adaptation. Uh, our own ethnographic research has shown that this preference involves a significant transformation to the governing mindset of nomadism or nomadic pastoralism as an adaptive practice, uh, which we would describe as being guided by a high level of responsiveness to change and uncertainty. Uh, for one thing, the plans that are required by these standards and the broader projects with which they're affiliated privilege rotational grazing arrangements over responsive mobility practices such as otter. Right, um, uh, PUG leaders, um, for example, in this context, describe to us their understanding of a distinction between normal and emergency mobility practices. Uh, in making this kind of distinction, the need to move on author becomes something a sign of something abnormal, perhaps rangeland degradation due to overgrazing or possibly drought attributed to climate change. The pathologized need for adaptive mobility thus becomes something to prevent. Uh, by changing livestock breeds, changing herd compositions, reducing herd sizes, investing in more livestock feed. Okay, So through technical interventions, through improvements or changes, uh, it's not something to be embraced and institutionally supported as a manifestation of core mobility practices. Uh, second, these mobility arrangements assume a stable group of herder uh, livestock owners within a given site over time, in preference over fluid groupings, for example, where different people, households, and herds live together from one year to the next. Uh, our own research demonstrates that even within families of relatively sedentary herders in the Hanga, there are frequent changes in the household and camp composition as children go to school, return during holidays, grandchildren are sent to live with their grandparents, uh, elderly, sick, or unemployed relatives come to the countryside, households split after marriage, combine after death. Uh, we have different combinations of household that come together at summer or winter camps in different years, depending on their needs. So the herder household in this context must not be seen as an autonomous, stable economic unit, but as part of a larger uh, community and network of relatives. So international consumers and organizations often imagine that herders are just cashmere suppliers, where herders are reduced to a specialized economic role, namely raising goats for cashmere income. In fact, goats bring, bring economic support to a larger, diverse system of nomadic cultural practices. The vibrancy of nomadic culture depends on herders not simply being goat producers, but also uh, dairy producers, added producers, felt producers, uh, harvesters of natural resources, custodians of natural sacred sites, and horse trainers, and so on. The one argument is, in this context is that the economic value of a product such as cashmere, therefore, should not depend only on the physical quality, namely like the micron quality of the fibers, but also on how well that product helps its producers to carry out and maintain other culturally significant practices. And in developing uh, sustainability indicators, we might take note of existing discourse within Mongolia on what cultural practices might be considered uh, significant and worth safeguarding. So we're running low on time, so I'm just going to jump ahead here to um, uh, to, to the conclusions here. Uh, I've described international marketing resor uh, resources as uh, marketing as framing sustainable cashmere and how those framings relate to uh, commodity governance chain issues, uh, uh, governance initiatives. I've suggested the need for more inclusiveness toward local producer voices, which may involve greater attention to political concerns framed in terms of cultural value. Um, so to end off, I just wanted to briefly mention where we're trying to take things next from a design anthropology perspective. Uh, design anthropology is an area of social cultural anthropology, which involves the collaborative creation of new cultural objects or processes in ways that are rooted in ethnographic research or theory. Uh, so at 
what we're trying to do here uh, is, um, what did I um, say here? Yeah, we're trying to explore ways to co-create and share knowledge about Kashmir within global commodity chains and to design and produce uh, ethical and sustainable Kashmir products from Mongolia and to experiment with marketing them using messages, messages about uh, cultural val uh, value through consumer research, pop-up events, online sales channels here in Canada involving students, uh, Fair Trade Manitoba, other organizations here in Manitoba. So more of an applied um, element focusing on the cultural dimensions of, of sustainability. Um, so at the outset of this process, you know, we're really just beginning in the past couple of months, we started listing a set of claims or assertions that we viewed as describing ethical and sustainable Kashmir from Mongolia. And then think about how we can justify them drawing on our own ethnographic research, interviews, and published sources about Kashmir production, or by designing specific commitments around those, uh, those claims. Okay, uh, one of the claims here relates to cultural sustainability, and I'll just end off here. Uh, at the product design level, the value that, or the claim that the product, that a product that we're selling is culturally appropriate, uh, can be backed by a series of potential commitments. Okay, so first, as a Kashmir brand, we can commit to redistributing a portion of revenues, not only in things like veterinary care and free medical checkups for herders, as we've seen some organizations already doing in Mongolia, but through cultural heritage safeguarding work at the national sum or bag level. Uh, these investments can take the form of a cultural dividend or sponsorships, donations, direct and in reinvestments of income. They could support cultural festivals, performances, training, research, advocacy work, and so on. Second, we can commit to communicating contextual information about Mongolian Kashmir producers to end consumers. Okay? And so these are all things that we're trying to do through our uh, design anthropology process here. So our own review that I started out with of these 700 advertisements and web pages and social media posts uh, from international, like English language brands and, uh, and organizations shows this tenor, uh, general tendency, as I've said, to describe these organizations is coming to rescue Mongolian herders and rangelands. They have nothing to say about who Mongolian herders are, what their own concerns are, spoken in their own voices and in their own terms. This is the type of information that could very easily be presented on a brand website or as part of a linked set of resources managed in association with upstream suppliers or with local organizations, such as our partner, the International Institute for the Study of Nomadic Civilizations. Third, we can commit to procurement strategies that explicitly support small-scale producers uh, with diversified livelihoods so that we're not trying to optimize or rationalize or intensify goat herding per se, but instead explicitly support goat herding as an element of a broader nomadic pastoral lively, uh, livelihood strategy as a larger part of pastoralism as culture. Fourth, we can commit to engaging in cultural value addition by embedding and celebrating culturally significant markers in the design, naming, branding, and marketing of uh, Kashmir products. This might also be viewed as a form of indigenization. And fifth, uh, approaching culture as a creative process, we can commit to co-designing products and, mark with, uh, and marketing messages uh, with local people in Mongolia, including uh, primary producers. So um, we're a bit low on time here. I did have this section on uh, you know, problems with standards and so on, but we can leave that for maybe for another time. Uh, so just to, 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 to finish off then, so these are some of the directions that we're taking in this design component of our research process. I've described some of the concerns with ways that sustainable Kashmir has been defined and marketed, including problematization of savior narratives, externally imposed standardized sustainability criteria. This research right now is a work in process. Our interviews with, with herders, our efforts to create collaborative representations of value, uh, ways of describing and defining uh, cultural value. This is all a work in progress. There are no easy answers or solutions to provide, but I do hope that our work uh, over the longer term will support and inspire efforts to find new ways of thinking about ethics and sustainability in global commodity chains. So thank you very much for your uh, attention and I welcome your comments and suggestions. All right, I don't know if anyone has any questions or, or their comments that they'd like to uh, to give in the uh, in the Zoom meeting. Um, otherwise, as I say, I mean, this is an ongoing, uh, ongoing research project. Uh, so we have uh, a team of researchers from uh, here. Here's, here comes the host. Uh, 
Yeah, so we do have a, a team of researchers going right now to the South Gobi uh, to uh, to do some more interviews with um, you know uh, project staff and with um, and here's one of them, right now, Pagma. Looks like yeah. So uh, yeah, doing doing some uh, about to do some interviews with herders and with with project staff and try to look at ways of uh, again sort of expanding this idea of of uh, sustainability to in, in, incorporate you know issues about cultural survival really uh, as one among many many dimensions and add this on as kind of the fourth pillar of sustainable development. Uh, I should say that part of this work is going to uh, end up with a set of policy recommendations to the Ministry of Culture in Mongolia. Um, and of course, this design work going on here at the consumer end in Canada, um, which is really just getting started, but we're sort of asking questions about what do we know and what do we not know? What kind of questions can we bring to uh, producers, to projects, to, to, to factories, to other processors in Mongolia uh, about where products come from and, and, and how they're made and what the priorities are of the people who are making them, uh, rather than trying to um, you know, sort of uh, create representations that are based on, uh, on what we would perceive uh, as, you know, so you know, ethics and or an ethical and, and sustainable uh, commodity chain. Well, this is a very complex and uh, interesting topic, Dr. Uh, Thrift. Um, I got a couple of questions that uh, came through through emails and uh, um, uh, Kashmir and herding is a very big issue. I've uh, had a two day uh, workshop with people who are uh, interested in geopolitics in Mongolia, and they certainly recognize overgrazing and uh, saturation of uh, rangelands as a uh, pressing issue for Mongolia too. And so I'll uh, get on with the questions. So these are uh, related to uh, overgrazing. Uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, do you think um, uh, intensive uh, factory farming of Kashmir goats can be a solution to uh, overcapacity uh, of uh, rangelands with goats and uh, even with other types of uh, livestock and uh, cattle in Mongolia. Yeah, so intensive grazing for sure. I mean, I think that's that is a solution if you want, um, you know, an, an intensive. Uh, like environmentally sort of resource efficient type of uh, production strategy, sure. Uh, I think that's not the question that we're asking, though. I mean, I think that's, you know, sort of the, the, the suggestion that we're trying to make in our project is, yes, I mean, that can be a solution if you're focusing on environmental impacts. Yes, if you're uh, in asking questions about how do we uh, increase or maximize or optimize incomes for herder operations? Uh, how do we streamline things, make them more efficient? How do we um, maintain consistent product quality or micron quality? I mean, there are all kinds of ways that you can address those kinds of issues. And, you know, I've been talking about what I call the, you know, these technical questions. Those are, you know, sort of technical problems that can be addressed uh, through more controlled types of operations. Uh, what they don't address though, uh, is you know, other, the, basically the, the cultural needs, which is kind of what we're trying to bring into the, into the picture as well. Because we also have a lot of people who are involved in the Kashmir trade, uh, who don't see themselves as you know, uh, goat herders. They don't see them, describe themselves as Kashmir producers. They're herders, they're Mongolians, you know, they keep a few goats, but that's really kind of a mechanism uh, through which they can obtain income that allows them to live in the countryside to do a whole bunch of other things that also bring value, right? Um, so by optimizing just the Kashmir production, uh, we're really leaving all the rest of that outside of the equation, okay? Um, so basically, you know, so what we're getting at here is that, yes, maybe for, you know, in some, you know, in some areas, for some people, that can be a solution. Um, the the broader solution or the broader uh, the broader question I think also needs to to bring in uh, bring into play the question about um, how to preserve uh, a mobile you know system of livelihoods uh, more generally and whether that involves you know things like you know caps on numbers of goats whether it involves things like um, you know price controls those are I think not technical solutions those are political um, political uh, dimensions uh, some of them may require Things like you know negotiations with China, which is like you know uh, it's hard to say how that how that might go if we're talking about international pricing because there there are, uh, you know it's hard to uh, put price controls on on markets. What can be done though, uh, some of the things that I was trying to suggest at the end of the of the solution or of the uh, the um, 
the presentation. Uh, if we're wanting to increase the price, I mean, this is, I think, a, a common uh, argument made by many of the, the, the projects inter, uh, or project interventions in Mongolia right now. Um, you know, if you can raise the price of, of uh, pastoral commodities, then uh, people don't need to have as many uh, as many goats and, and sheep. And likewise, if you increase the efficiency or the, the productivity of an individual uh, animal. So let's leave the, the productivity question aside. We just talk about pricing. If you can get twice as much money for you know, the same number of goats, well, you don't need that many goats. You can have a smaller herd. Okay, that argument makes sense. And there are uh, you know, some organ organizations have try tried to do this. Uh, in practice, it's very difficult to, you know, to buy cashmere at a premium and then to sell it at a premium when the market rate and everybody else is offering you know, a, a different rate. You, know, uh, you can't you know, charge necessarily double what everybody else is uh, because downstream, uh, your cashmere is going to end up costing much, much more. And there's only a certain amount that, that uh, consumers are willing to pay. And so this is where the question of uh, translating cultural value uh, downstream, right to the up to the up to the uh, the end consumer, it, it is an area where we see a, a bit of promise in the sense that okay, you know, we're not just talking about ecological value here. We're not just talking about you know the product uh, material value, the material value, the, the softness and the, the the micron quality of the cashmere. We're also talking about the intangible value that it brings to the producers themselves. So even though this particular garment, this the scarf or the uh, sweater that you're buying may have you know somewhat coarser uh, fibers than on other companies, even though you know it may be a little bit more expensive, by buying this, you're also sort of investing in, or you're supporting in something that makes you feel good because you're helping, uh, you know, the cultural survival in a sense, right? I mean, I think that you know that's that basically the, the marketing message um, that can, in other words, that can help us to construct a, a price premium that benefits, uh, you know, that, that benefits uh, herders upstream. It's difficult to do this, I think, on a, on a large scale. Um, you know, so we are trying to uh, experiment right now, as I as I mentioning with with different messaging uh, and you know consumer research, um, but also trying to you know to to bring some of that. That maybe right now there's no information at all really about uh, herders, other than the fact that you know they, they have too many goats really. Um, so so what are the positive values, uh, and and what kind of an impact can those positive values have? That's a very, also a very complex answer to uh, question. Uh, yes. Definitely. Well, uh, so I, I'm addressing... an anthropologist, and we like to think about complex things in very complex ways. <laughs> no easy solutions, of course. really. So uh... Uh, definitely, uh, factory farming would leave out the human human aspect, uh, and with that, uh, cultural and traditional aspects of the uh, issue that you're trying to address. Uh, mm -hmm. And you sort of uh, uh, mentioned China in your answer. So the the other question was about. China. So uh, the question reads: um, Have you uh, seen any com comparisons of grazing and cashmere production between Mongolia and China? And as you know, China being the other uh, big cashmere producer. So, if so, uh, uh, what was the difference? And do does China have any concerns about sustainability and ethical uh, cashmere production? Yes. Well, so that's, I mean, that's something that I can't really claim direct knowledge of right now because we haven't done, um, you know, field work in, in China. It's it's also, it is more difficult. And of course, it, you know, everything being shut down with COVID. Uh, so really only, you know, it got things started in with this research project about two years ago. So originally we were supposed to have uh, been doing, doing a lot more field work. We had originally planned actually to to do some work in, uh, in parts of China, in Aosan, for example. Um, so that's, hasn't been happening. Uh, I think that's for a later stage. So I can't really comment directly from you know have, uh, from what I might have seen. I do know that uh, sustainability questions are raised in China, uh, in Inner Mongolia. I do know also that there are various indirect forms of subsidy. Like if we're thinking about the economic uh, dimensions, um, a subsidy that makes cashmere from China much more competitive economically. Uh, so uh, from the like from the retailer or from the uh, you know, from the label perspective, if they're looking for suppliers, uh, China can often be a much more attractive option if you're looking at price. And they do make commitments to sustainability, right? They do claim, you know, we have limits, we have caps on the number of goats that, you know, that people can have. Um, so we are conscious about sustainability, but it's a very different type of uh, sustainability. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a form that, um, I don't know, it's, a, it's a, in more of an intensified uh, production. 
Um, I did mention the example of Loro Piano, the luxury producer. They have what amount? It's it's very very similar to to the standards that have been uh, in, suggested and, and introduced in Mongolia, uh, in terms of like animal uh, humane or animal welfare standards, in terms of basically livestock production uh, standards, and so that you know they. Um, they have introduced this as a way of like certifying producers, and uh, that's only within their own particular procurement uh, chain. I think they have a little bit of um, space there that's uh, that's a, that presents an opportunity that's not available across the commodity chain. In the sense that they're a big, well, I mean, not in, in company wise, they're they're not really big volume wise. They're not big, but they command uh, an important uh, segment of the you know the luxury uh, or the luxury segment of um you know um uh, of of cashmere apparel right so they are able to to sell things for many times the price uh, that you would see uh in uh, um you know in your in your Walmart well not that Walmart sells uh, you know cashmere but you know comparable like budget uh, budget stores and we see them here in Canada you saw sub $100 cashmere sweaters uh, exist they're they're not from Mongolia. Uh, I mean, there's no capacity right now in Mongolia to 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 produce them. Um, and certainly, if we add on to that the sustainability claims, saying you know Mongolia, you know you're buying it from Mongolia, you're supporting Mongolians, and it's sustainable. Uh, that's going to bring the, the 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 price even more because that involves much more in terms of um, uh, you know production costs potentially. Uh, organic certification is something I didn't mention. I was thinking of, of bringing up, but that's also that also brings on added costs, right? Uh, so we can't label uh, cashmere right now as organic, um, like we could, but it requires a very stable procurement chain. It requires that you have uh, the same suppliers all the time. That you're always getting your cashmere from the same families. That they've been certified. Like every actor within the value chain has to have been certified. Um, right, so they need to have you know auditors go in and and you know make sure that there is. We know that of course that all the cashmere that comes from Mongolia is or, organic. There's there's no doubt about that, right? Um, but in terms of like the formal certification, that's also very difficult to uh, to achieve in Mongolia. So I think you know one of the things that I'm also suggesting here is that we can find alternative ways of making those same claims without necessarily relying on this burdensome. Uh, you know, external auditing standard system that presents a little bit more about the the, the context. As if you know uh, how Mongolians manage livestock, you already know that that it's organic. You already know that there is an animal welfare component there. You know that they're they're not being you know second cages and and force fed simply because that's the, you know, that, that's not a part of what uh, you know what pastoralism is like. Um, and so, in that sense, also uh, you know the the question about sustainability uh, versus of like mobile pastoralism versus farm production or intensified production, right? Also, you know, comes in, into play there because we know by virtue of the fact that people are uh, are, are nomadic that the animal welfare uh, boxes are being checked. Uh, we know that you know um, you know the various other uh, aspects of the organic production boxes are being checked, which is not necessarily the case with with farm production. Uh, so there is this kind of yeah, I, I guess I mean diverging a little bit from the original question about about China, uh, but I think that there are differences in the production methods here that allow. I think Mongolians or people purchasing from Mongolia uh, to make somewhat different claims, right? Uh, in sort of marketing and in you know designing products uh, from Mongolia, different claims that relate to the culture uh, um, and the the processes of production and what value uh, is created through that. So I, I think that's I mean basically where we need to go. Not trying to compete on price because that's an impossibility, uh, and not trying to compete on the technical claims of sustainability because I think that's also something where uh, the China also has a has a leg up. And I also imagine that the uh, ethical concerns in China might not include uh, the traditions and culture of the uh, people who raised the goats. To yeah, I see somebody put in the comment here in the chat, the geographical indication. I think this is also a part of the, uh, like, anytime you're marketing products, like here in Canada and, and, you know, the United States as well, throughout Europe, like, there needs to be a country of origin mentioned on the on the textile label. Um, but the country of origin, and I think this is also, this also relates to Mongolia, right? Because the uh, the country of origin is where the majority of the, the, the work has been done, right? So what you can do, for instance, is have... Uh, you know, purchase raw cashmere or like spun cashmere. You can buy uh, um, yarn from Mongolia, um, weave it or knit the yarn in Italy, for example, and, and have a cashmere garment that is made in Italy. 
uh, and not say anything at all about the origin of the cashmere as the, the, the raw product, right? And so a lot of what we actually see now says made in Italy in terms of cashmere. Like there's nothing that's made in Canada, but there is a lot that's made in Italy. Uh, and, you know, that really obscures the importance of the, the of the source producers. Uh, so geographical indication, we have the, you know, the King Fiber uh, mark uh, that's been introduced in Mongolia. Uh, I have not seen that in use um you know, outside of Mongolia, really, uh, well, we can see if that takes off. But I think that's also a question of adopt adoption for 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 brands themselves. Um, you know, simply saying that something is made in Mongolia uh, doesn't necessarily indicate um, increased value to consumers, um, unless it's accompanied by some indication of like why that is a differentiation, right? So we do see things like made in China, like you know, lots of cashmere sweaters, the especially low end ones. Uh, it'll say uh, made in China. We associate China with sort of um, you know, low and inexpensive consumer goods. Uh, Mongolia has this kind of exoticism value to it. I don't think that's necessarily what we want to prioritize. What we do want to uh, say is it's more, uh, I mean, there is more value. It's, it's more of a luxury value, uh, but also more of a cultural value, as I've been saying, right? So what is the, uh, you know, being a bit more open and explicit and, and presenting more information about the about the background of garments, I think, uh, is 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 what we need to do. And we see attempts to do that through fair trade, through other certification schemes. But you know, when everything is kind of reduced to a set of indicators, it, I think it becomes less helpful to end consumers. Right? It says made in Mongolia or organically certified, fair trade certified. Okay, I can buy it and, and it makes me feel good, but it reduces engagement between me as a consumer and those who've been involved in the production process, because uh, it essentially, in a sense, it becomes a barrier to, to finding out more about, uh, about the producers. So anyway, there's, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of work to do uh, in kind of building this. And I think, to, you know, to me, it's, it's a very interesting area for creating dialogue, you know, between people here in Canada who know nothing at all about Mongolia, right? Those of us who, you know, have worked in Mongolia, who are Mongolian, who, you know, or who have a vested interest in, uh, you know, Mongolia's economy and culture, you know, how do you, you know, interest other people in that, right? If I say, you know, everybody should be interested in Mongolian culture, well, I mean, it's not inherently interesting to everybody. Uh, but if I say, uh, you know, well, actually, like, do you know where your clothing comes from? Do you know who made it? Uh, do you know what kind of an impact that is having on people's lives and their livelihoods and whether it's consistent with what, you know, how they want to live their lives? I mean, those are questions I think that, that people can relate to. Uh, and, you know, it actually does lead to some very interesting conversations. Of, oh, you know, I didn't know, uh, you know, that that's, you know, where where the, where it comes from. I didn't know that Mongolians were, were you know, still nomadic, uh, this kind of thing. So, I mean, there are, I think there's an interest there that we just need to, 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 to kindle, uh, in a sense. Right. Uh, so, uh, next question is uh, uh, sort of on what you uh, touched on. So, one of the uh, in one of the commitments, uh, you talked about uh, investing in culture. So, um, the source of the in, uh, investment in this in this culture should come from uh, revenue from uh, that is uh, made from selling cashmere products. So, uh, do you think that there should be a, a sort of a endowment fund, like a cashmere endowment fund, that invests in culture? Uh, would that be a good solution to uh, uh, sort of concentrate enough funds to uh, then again use to invest in culture and tradition of the herder family? Sure. Yeah, I think that that sounds like a great solution. I'm always reluctant to say that there's a single solution to any uh, any problem, though. Right. Uh, one of the I was deliberate in uh, identifying these as commitments as opposed to standards um, and sort of feeling a little bit rushed at the end. I sort of. Uh, uh, Cut out a, a, a little bit that I was thinking of saying on that, but I mean, the, the problem with, with setting like very precise criteria for like how things are going to be done is that they can uh, get in the way of more creative solutions, and I think that's really what we want to do. Like speaking again from this this idea of design, right, as a learning process, as a creative process. Right? I'm interested in you know designing cashmere like with people here in Canada with and in collaboration with people in Mongolia, you know, designing new products that sort of meet these social cultural criteria, okay? Uh, and that, you know, bring value and that make people happy to, to, to buy them and satisfied with them, right? So this is a creative process. And if we can find new ways of creating uh, value within that new events, new forms of endowment, then that's great. 
Uh, I would be reluctant to endorse a very centralized uh, type of system where, you know, it's, you know, sort of one body that says on behalf of all Kashmir, you know, products we're taking, you know, we're taking a tax, for example, and that's going to support, you know, these particular events, because that, the effect of that is that, you know, they uh, have the power then to determine what's important and what's not. And to me, what really matters is not sort of what the money gets spent on. So, I mean, that does matter, of course, but also the fact that we're having conversations on value. Right. So the very act of having these discussions uh, separately among different producers with consumers, uh, discussions around sort of what matters, what we should fund, right, where the money should go, right, what do we value, um, and I think we can see different value propositions across the different, um, you know, the different brands or labels of cashmere, right? They can say, okay, we're selling, you know, when you buy from us, okay. You know, you might be buying the exact same scarf as, you know, somebody else. It's also cashmere. It's also you know, done by machine. It's also, you know, knit by machine, etc. Uh, so in terms of material properties, there's not all that much distinction between the property, you know, the what different companies are offering. In some cases, the design may be a little bit different. Uh, in some cases, the intangible value may be a little bit different. Or the people who benefit from it, right? So the income from that may be invested in different communities, right? And so you can claim, okay, we're investing in, and as some companies have done this, right? And I, I give the example of Natham, for instance, that they, you know, we invest in veterinary care, they paid for, uh, you know, doctor's visits, bringing doctors from Mulan Badr to, to, to do uh, medical checkups uh, for people in the sites of procurement. Okay, so these are claims that make people say, okay, yeah, it's worth it to pay a little bit more, uh, you know, to buy from this company, because these are things that they're supporting, that they're investing in, that we care about, and we see as, as being value. Uh, so I think these discussions about value and, and conveying why those are important is also part of the process. Um, so an endowment can be part of it, but I would like to ideally see a, a sort of a broader uh, set of actions. Um, so I mentioned things like a premium. So, I mean, if you have a cooperative, certainly the the the, uh, the herder cooperative can distribute um, money as a cash premium, but it can also invest in in uh, cultural actions like you know festivals or or heritage uh, you know restoration or or uh, safeguarding and marketing, etc. Uh, we can uh, do research activities. We can do um, you know lobbying and promotion and you know advocacy work. We can um, work with government agencies. Uh, I put on the screen earlier in the slideshow the the, the representative list of natural uh, or um, uh, intangible cultural heritage uh, ratified by the uh, government of Mongolia and submitted to UNESCO. So we already have this uh, a list at that level of. Uh, elements that are considered by Mongolians to be important. Um, so one option, of course, is to support efforts that are already there, right, to to, to safeguard uh, intangible heritage at the national level. But we also have lists at the local level. Every SUM has, you know, a culture center with somebody who is responsible for, you know, identifying uh, bearers of cultural heritage, for example. That's another resource, you know. Uh, so there's not just one way to, to, to go about doing it. Um, I think if we can, you know, be creative and work with people in local communities, right? And, and ask these questions and have discussions, right? How should we spend money, uh, spend the income from, from Kashmir in ways that don't just benefit like the owners of the company that don't just sort of, you know, end at the process where, okay, we buy the, you know, uh, you know, one kilogram of, you know, Kashmir from you, from you for 130,000 Turkics, that's the end of it. Like we actually have, you know, some, after we sell it, you know, we have a, a certain amount of the, the proceeds that we're going to, uh, to to donate or reinvest or or use for community benefit, right? And so what can that be? I think those those conversations themselves are, are very important. Mm, interesting. So a sort of inclusive and at the same time out of the box thinking approach is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, Don't well, I thought. mean, not necessarily. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think uh, we're... Uh, about 20 minutes over time. So uh, we sh uh, we should end uh, at around now, but uh, you, you said it yourself, uh, we must have you another time and continue this okay. conversation. Uh, this is a really important topic for our rural communities. And this should, uh, these things should be addressed and uh, we should uh, continue this uh, conversation later on too. Yep. And uh, have a good rest of the day. And thank you for uh, 
being our guest tonight and this morning for you. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me and I uh, look forward to, to seeing everyone again soon.